Hey guys, welcome back. So I'm really excited to share with you some excellent investing wisdom from the legend that is John C. Bogle, known to his friends as Jack. Jack Bogle is the founder of Vanguard and the man responsible for the creation of the very first index fund, a product that has completely changed the investing world. When Jack Bogle launched Vanguard, they had only $1.5 billion of assets under management. Now, what many people don't realize is that Vanguard wasn't initially a success. For nearly 20 years, it struggled to get customers and traction, but Jack Bogle powered on believing in his mission and the power of indexing. And did it work? Well, for the last 20 years, Vanguard has exploded to now $6.7 trillion of assets under management. So in this video, I'm happy to share with you Jack Bogle's 10 principles for investing success. And it's funny because I've seen these principles about five times now, and I still learn something new every time I watch it. As always, if you do find anything useful in the video, be sure to drop a like, that would be much appreciated. Okay, sit back and relax guys. Here is Jack himself to talk you through his 10 principles for investing success. Enjoy. Okay, that's the, probably the, that's number one of the rules, and that's the most important of all. And that is, we talked a little bit about this earlier, but that means that don't look back at past performance, because all mutual funds, one way or the other, if they do very well in one period, they will do badly in the next period. If they do badly in the first period, they'll do well in the second period. It's so clear in the industry data, and the only thing you can say to balance that a little bit off is high-cost funds don't do quite as well in the good periods and do a little worse in the bad periods. So cost remains a factor. Uh, but reversion to the mean means don't think the past is prologue. It rarely is, and sometimes it's anti-prologue. Think of the value of compounding. Get yourself out a little compound interest table and see that at 7%, money doubles every 10 years, and then it doubles again, and then it doubles again, and then it doubles again, and doubles again, and doubles again. And by the time you're at retirement age, if you start investing when you're 50, it's multiplied You'll have to tell me, but let me say uh, 35 or 40 times over. Unbelievable. Maybe even more than that. I mean, don't make mistakes at the start. Pick a good fund and hold it through thick and thin. And I would argue very strongly if you're looking at an actively managed fund, and you should be very careful to buy the low cost ones, even if it's actively managed, that don't get despondent when it does badly because it comes and goes. So hold tight, buy, buy right, hold tight means don't let yourself be diverted by changes in the manager's performance, unless it's grossly excessive, and by changes in the market. You know, we had all these years of 17% annual returns in the 80s and 90s, and people were surprised, I can't imagine why, that we had essentially zero return on common stocks in the first decade of the 21st century. Reversion centuries. to the mean again. Reversion to the mean, absolutely. <laughs> I still think Bill Gross, who does the, does the new normal kind of idea, is a little bit below me, but I think common stocks should earn a nominal return of around 7%, nominal meaning before inflation. And I don't make that up. I think the dividend, the dividend yield is a very, very important thing in this, and that's 2% today. So corporate earnings should grow at about 5% in nominal terms. I think that's about right because corporate earnings grow at the same rate of, as the economy. Even over short periods, the annual correlations are remarkably high. And so you can look with reasonable expectations for a 7% return. Don't look for 11, don't look for 15, don't look for nothing, don't await the coming of the next bear market. Those are all guesses. And you know, some, some of those guesses will be good, some not so good. But uh, when, so there's the 7% that will double your money every 10 years. And if that happens, and it's the high odds, it, it should be uh, good sailing, but below the long-term norm of 9% because of that lower dividend. Now, one thing that trips us up when we get into these returns is that there's one other, I gave you the formula for the investment return or fundamental return on, a, on, on stocks, which is dividend yield plus earn, corporate earnings growth. Because the stock market you know, doesn't contribute anything to this, it's corporations that do that. They got a lot of capital, they invest it well, they, re, they pay out dividends and reinvest the rest. This is not a complicated system. So uh, you go that far with investment return. There's always this nasty little element of speculative return. And then if a multiple of earnings, and the amount people will pay for a dollar of earnings, goes from 10 to 20, say, that's a double, and over 10 years, that's an addition of 7% return. So if it doubles in this coming period, 
that would add, take that 7% up to 14%. Is that likely to happen? No, it is not. It's almost inconceivable. Because the price in the market, it seems to me, is roughly fairly valued today. At around, I use, people use all kinds of numbers, I use sort of a central number of 16 times earnings. And you know, if it goes to 18 times earnings, or goes down to 14 times earnings, that's not going to, over 10 years, that's not going to affect that 7% very much. If it goes to 25 times earnings, I can't imagine, that would take the earnings way up. And if it goes to four times earnings, which is really pretty inconceivable, that would take it down. So I look for speculative return to add nothing or subtract anything from that investment return. And the interesting thing about that is we think so much about speculative return, day to day, year to year, decade to decade even, but in the long term, say 100 years, speculative return is going to be zero. Buying a good manager is like looking for a needle in a haystack. <laughs> and everybody knows what that's about. Uh, good old Don Quixote had it about right. And, uh, so it just makes common sense. Own the whole market and not just a few stocks. That's a, you don't need to take the risk of individual stocks. Take the market risk, which is quite high enough. You don't have to take both. Go for low cost right. funds and especially index funds. Think about that for a minute. I don't like the risk in the stock market. So put your money in a savings account, a certificate of deposit. There's no risk there. Wait a minute. The return there is probably going to be about one and a half percent and we're going to have 2.5% inflation. So the real return is essentially, and this has been true all over history, that the return on a savings account, the nominal, not the nominal return, the real return, the nominal return of say 1.5% at the moment, very, very low, uh, turns into a real ret return of minus 1%. So is there any risk in putting money in a savings account? You better believe it. And everybody needs a little bit of an anchor to windward but keep that low. And of course, in these days with the money market, I would strongly recommend short and intermediate term corporate bonds to replace at least part of that because the yields there at least exist. <laughs> Saying something these days. A great example is uh, people started to worry about inflation about 20 years ago. And so we had funds, inflation beaters fund and all that kind of thing. That was the last war. Inflation then pretty much stopped for a long time. And uh, the inflation that we had from, let me say, post-World War II to say around 1980, and we, we always have some inflation, but it got to be six, seven, eight percent in some years. And so people want to protect themselves about that. They forget that if you look at the wholesale price in London, one good measure of inflation, uh, the prices before World War I were exactly what they'd been at the time of the great fire in London in 1666. <laughs> That's a long time to have no inflation, but <laughs> you never know what's going to happen on that front. So another, I mean, part of that caution is your job is to get the biggest gross return because inflation is going to take whatever it takes out of that return. And if it's a big return, it will move it down a little. But if it's a little return, it will eliminate it. So you want to think of never, you never want to forget that. That's one of my favorites. I didn't make it up. There's a Greek poet back probably in the third century BC named Archilochus. And they found a little fragment of Archilochus' writing and it said, the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one great thing. And in our business, the foxes are all those managers who are smarter, they got all those computers, all those brilliant Harvard Business School graduates, armies of them, and they know everything. And they know far more than I could dream of knowing. I know one great thing, and that is if you own the market, which they do collectively, naturally, uh, if you own the market, you are guaranteed in a low cost index fund you are guaranteed to earn your share, fair share of whatever the stock market is kind enough to give us. And let's be very clear on this, whatever return the, a bad market is mean-spirited enough to take away from us. So it's the hedgehog who wins. And the poor fox with all his wiles and his marketing department who figures out what everybody wants, all those crazy things that go on in our business, he's yesterday and he's going. The best thing to do is behavioral, let me start with this premise. Most investors, many investors, probably the majority, lose because of their own behavior and not because of how stocks and bonds do. They are trailers, they buy something that's done well and think it's gonna do well in the future and it doesn't. Uh, they, a whole lot of bad behavioral patterns, if they find a hot manager, they jump on the bandwagon and that doesn't work. They just can't do it and the markets are really, just think about this for a minute, 
really counterintuitive because when do you feel you're most optimistic and most happy and enthusiastic about buying stocks? At the market peak. <laughs> when are you scared to death about stocks and really want to get out at the market bottom? So you get in at the top and out in the bottom. Do you think you're going to do well doing that? So figure out a sound program, I would argue, one with an appropriate sec part of, of uh, bond, bonds and bond funds, really, and stock funds, index funds, I would say, in both cases, and let that allocation favor bonds a little bit more as you get older, and finally, quite heavily, when you get to retirement, and uh, almost all in stocks before you start down that road. And that's a good formula for working. It doesn't have to be a formula, but a good rule of thumb, heuristic, as the academics would say. And so that's what staying the course means. Set the right course, and then don't let all these superficial, emotional, momentary things get in your way. Another way of putting it is, don't do something, just stand there. So there you are guys, that was the legend Jack Bogle's 10 Principles for Investing Success. Such an incredible man and I hope you enjoyed them just as much as me. In fact, just one favour to ask, if you did find anything useful in the video or just a big fan of Jack Bogle, be sure to drop a like. It only takes two seconds and that would be really much appreciated. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, I invite you to click below and join us. I do have some great videos coming up that you don't wanna miss. Okay, cheers guys, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.